Longevity is, I would call it, a beautiful mess. And I presented at a conference in Berlin, and after I'd finished the presentation, I thought, I really need to change things. I need to change the way that we are communicating the industry. And uh, Aubrey, who we've heard from, um, he and I have been working on this a little bit, and a few other key opinion leaders. And I'm going to share with you today, the first time I've actually shared this publicly, uh, what we call the 10 levels of longevity. Now, one level is no more important than another. Um, but as you can see, when you go from lifestyle management, which is level one, through to corporal and consciousness preservation, which we've just heard about, you're going through the sort of, let's call it the, uh, the time scales of how these technologies are going to roll out. So I've got, a, I've got 11 minutes to canter through all 10 of them, which I'm going to do very quickly. So, um, lifestyle management. We've, I'm sure many of you have got wearables. We all know diet, sleep, exercise. Those are the basics that we need to be working with. And it's an established industry, right? You know, Whoop, Aura, Apple, all of those organizations are in. Where as investors, where should you be looking? Well, companies that are starting to integrate all that complex data through AI to give highly personalized experiences for users, they're companies to look out for. And likewise, uh, the gym and wellness industry is really looking at longevity now. And this crossover, they're looking for something new and they're looking for assets to buy and companies to partner with. And this is a very exciting uh, aspect of the wellness industry that's looking for, for longevity. Consumer diagnostics, well, the, the science is not there, uh, the science is happening, uh, but it's not validated and it's not finalized. And of course, we all think as humans about our biological and our chronological age, um, but of course there are deep scientists out there that really, really need to understand whether they're actually moving the needle on, on biological age. So the opportunities here are for those companies that are bridging between the clinical community and the consumer community. And um, you know, we've all had biological age tests, I've, had, I've been 10 years younger, two years older, so the continuity is not there in the marketplace at the moment. Supplements we've talked about, um, there are a lot of supplements coming into the space and Nira said uh, he wants to see supplements that have got human evidence behind them. There are definitely some, some companies out there that have got human studies, uh, but they're, the new ones are the ones that are look, using those AI discovery platforms to identify new molecules that will be recognized, generally regarded as safe, which means that they don't have to go through the, the vagaries of the uh, clinical approval process, but also organizations that are using pharmaceutical grade manufacturing processes to have much higher quality um, and effective compounds and molecules in their, in their ingredients. And then likewise, those are the ones, the ones that are building clinical evidence. They're the ones that need to have the funding to do the clinical evidence, but they're the ones that are going to be able to make much more um, adventurous marketing claims in the marketplace, which is what, uh, which is what we want. Clinics. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to longevity clinics. I have been to a couple. They've been amazing. They've, I've been asymptomatic on two aging conditions. I'm 57. I you know it's been very helpful to have the guidance of these clinicians. And there are, in our data sets now, over 220 uh, longevity clinics. And they're not high street IV clinics. They are proper, uh, proper clinics. And they're all out there. They're doing great work. There is a need for industry standards. There's a need for the ability to go from Dubai and then go to Florida and have the same interactions across the same protocols, but that's happening. And where are the investment opportunities? Well, these organizations need an awful lot of complex IT sitting behind them, and that's an opportunity. The crossover, as I mentioned, between the wellness sector and the gym sector, we're seeing that in luxury real estate and so on, and this is, again, another scaling factor. And obviously, the companies that have got the interventions and treatments that can be brought to those clinics, those, again, are very, very interesting investment opportunities. So this is very, very much alive. So I've gone through four of the layers, and those first four layers are really what I would call, as we were discussing yesterday, and this one too, level five, the longevity now. What is in the marketplace that is being used, and how are people making money, and are people getting a return on investment? And aging disease management, basically those drugs that uh, Neil was talking about just a, just a moment ago, those drugs that are approved, being deployed in patients for specific aging diseases that may be showing the ability to work on aging itself, those are very, very powerful. But this level five are all those organizations that are currently working on the sick care healthcare model, right? So they're fixing a disease once it's happened. 
But in the longevity biotech space, the companies that are doing this work that may not be completely approved yet, they are the ones that are working on aging drivers. So they have the ability to be in the position where they can potentially prevent those diseases from happening in the first place or in the future reverse those diseases. But what the companies in the space are doing now is they have to choose an aging disease to get the regulatory approval to get to the point where they can get to market. But this is a very exciting space where we're seeing the transition from traditional healthcare uh, into the point where it's becoming longevity. So aging prevention is what we really want to get to, right? So we want to be in a position where you don't get the disease in the first place. And Neil was talking about prevention just, just a moment ago. So again, those companies that are choosing those aging diseases now because they have to, whether they're choosing cardiovascular disease or diabetes or whatever it may be, they are the prevention companies in the future. And you've all heard of GLP-1s and Azempic and Magovi. That is really a demonstration of the technology that these companies are starting to work on. The very, very interesting thing is that the companies that are getting to the point where they can go from their animal studies into their first in human, which is when they go to phase one, if they can demonstrate that they're safe in humans and they've got a trajectory of success to the point where they can get into their phase two trials, which is where they're not only proving uh, safety, they're also proving efficacy, those are the companies that Big Pharma are interested in. And the investment opportunities are finding the right assets that go from the preclinical to the early clinical that have got the trajectory to fit the portfolio of the Big Pharma companies. And if anybody tells you that Big Pharma don't get longevity, I, I, would, I would argue against that. They're all very engaged in this, in this sector. So the concept of reversal is something that is very challenging, and this goes potentially into different realms of the biotech sector. So level seven is what we call targeted aging disease reversal, which is where you're targeting an organ to be able to reverse its age. And this can be done through tissue, this can be done through uh, other localized reversal services at a kind of cellular level. And when you look at the companies that are in this space, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Altos Labs. They were, they were in the figures for 2024. They raised another billion, another billion from Mubadala, so they're, they're actually, their war chest is big. But there are over 30 other companies in the partial recellular space. And the interesting thing is they're all using a fairly common technique, so there's going to be some M&A in this space as well. So if, if Mubadala, uh, sorry, if um, uh, Altos aren't moving fast enough and there are smaller companies that are moving faster, then there's going to be some M&A activity in there. So these, these partial cellular reprogramming companies are very experimental. They're probably at phase one, phase, phase two in the sort of levels that we talk about, but they're, they're very interesting opportunities in the future. And then the concept of systemic age reversal, which is the point where you can actually uh, regenerate the whole uh, the whole organism is something where we all want to get to. And there are some very interesting technologies that are out there. We're going to hear later today about uh, mitochondrial transplant, very exciting technology. Xenotherapeutics, which is obviously senescence and clearing out that cellular waste. There is the potential of cellular um, rejuvenation across the whole body, but it's still very, very early stage. So I want to calibrate where we are. So we've heard a very interesting presentation, which is very relevant to this, which is if we don't get there, what can we do in the meantime to, uh, to keep everything rolling? Now, again, regulation is something where regulators are catching up on AI, they're catching up on social media, but this industry has got to go through the vagaries of the regulatory pathway, which is right and proper that it does, that it does so. But when you look at how somebody like Swiss Re thinks about how and when we're going to see these therapeutics coming through, you can see that they're, they're saying it's going to be 35 years away. And Emil just said he doesn't know, right? Anybody that's a fan or an active participant in this industry, they'll tell you it's going to be way, way earlier than that. But of course, we don't know. So the key thing is what, what do we do if we can't actually uh, move quickly enough? Well, these are, this is level nine, which is, as we heard about, is the ability to be able to preserve the organism whether this is basically replacing damaged organs, heart transplants, and so forth. So you've got now uh, 3D bioprinting. You've got the ability of xenotransplantation, where you've got personalized organs being grown inside a, a donor animal, or even prosthetics. There are bionic hearts out there. So, and we've heard about the ability for cryopreservation to, to preserve organs. Um, cryopreservation has gone into a new phase. It's being taken much more seriously now. We heard about Cradle yesterday as a company that's raised, I think, sort of 40 million or something uh, to, to develop the technologies to resuscitate these, uh, these tissues. So it's becoming a very, very interesting aspect to the business. And a 
kid you not, we're having conversations with people about head transplantation and spinal cord transplantation. And yeah, there are some very interesting conversations being had in the space. And then, of course, if all of that fails, as we've heard already, then there's the concept of cryopreservation, which means that you're in a position where at least you can benefit from this as you go forward in, in the future. So this is a very, very interesting industry because we're all individual clients of this industry and whether you're making an investment decision or a scientific decision it's going to have an everything's going to have a material effect on your mortality the great news is is that healthcare is improving around the world so medium life expectancy is is on a very very positive trajectory um, and the thing is is that if you're an investor how are you going to make money out of this and i had a very good conversation last night about how you get a return on investment out of a supplement company or a clinical company. But of course, the biotechs are the ones that are going to be the ones that generate the very, very interesting revenue opportunities.